All right. So my name is Brandy Pethel. I'm the Master Gardener Extension Volunteer at the University of Georgia Extension Office here in Jackson County. Um, right now I'm the only Master Gardener Volunteer. We would love some extra volunteers. <laughs> but um, today I'm presenting on plant nutrition and soils and there's kind of like a subline. This is evidence-based fertilizing. So this is, I'm gonna explain to you basically, if I can get it to change. Oh, here we go. Um, what is the difference between plant nutrition and fertilization? What does it mean for your soil? What are different soils uh, going to do when it comes to fertilization? So first of all, nutrition, it's, it's what the plant needs. It's kind of those basic elements it needs to survive, similar to us. We need carbohydrates, fats, and um, what's the other one, <laughs> protein. <laughs> Plants need carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and then there's, and you can see that's the blue section here. Uh, then there's some primary macronutrients that are here. That's your um, NPK. And then your secondary nutrients <clears throat> are all those other and micronutrients. Just, they need tiny, tiny amounts for that plant to survive. Uh, fertilization is supplying all those nutrients as amendments. So here, I, I forgot that I had this slide here. So those primary macronutrients, again, that is this orange sliver here, which is not a lot, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, that's water, and then carbon, carbon dioxide for carbon and oxygen. So most of what a plant needs is carbon dioxide and water. Um, those macronutrients are, I referenced them as NPK, that's what you're gonna find in a fertilizer bag. It's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, without those, a plant will suffer. Uh, the secondary macronutrients and micronutrients are ones that if the level is low in it, it can affect some of the macronutrients and their uptake, or you'll just have a really specific issue with the plant. But they're, they're a little bit harder to diagnose. Um, a soil test will give you primary and secondary, um, but it's not going to give you these micronutrients. Um, there are tests you could do, but typically they're so little needed that it, it's just there in the soil. You don't have to worry too much about those micros. So this is kind of the path that we're gonna take through the presentation. So it's all about nutrient availability in the soil. The plants have to grow in the soil. It's what characteristics of the soil are allowing those nutrients to be taken up by the plant. So it depends on the type of soil, soil water, soil pH, the nutrients themselves in the soil and growing conditions. So we'll start stepping through that. So according to the North Carolina State Extension, soil is a living, breathing, natural entity composed of solids, liquids, and gases. A lot of times when we think in the garden, we're thinking the plant's growing, the plant is living, the plant is what is, is you know, what we're taking care of. But without taking care of the soil and the life that is there in the soil, the nutrients, the liquids, and the gases, your plant is not going to be as vigorous or as um, productive as you want it to be. So what is it that's in soil? We've got about a quarter of it is water, a quarter air, believe it or not, um, and half of it is mineral and organics. Um, so minerals are the um, silicates, the the actual soil particles uh, that are that's in the soil. The organic matter is the stuff that once was alive that's decomposing in the soil. And obviously we know what water is and air. So this is a little kind of cross-section image drawing of a plant root. So you can see this little root hair going out in between these soil particles. Um, you can see there's a lot of water, there's a lot of air, and then there's these, these little particles that are in there. Um, so if you Think about that in, in those terms, there's a lot more going on in soil than just, it's just the stuff the roots are in. Um, so in mineral soil components, you have sand, silt, and clay. So these are the, the particles that are in there. Um, most of you are probably like, well, I've got clay, you know. <laughs> we don't have a problem with clay here in, in Georgia. We have plenty of it. Um, right here next to me, I have a couple jars. So this jar with the two golf balls in it is like, I couldn't put a third one in there because it would have fallen out. 
um, it's kind of an image of sand. So if you could, you know, if we had just a, a teaspoon of sand or something like that, and we blew it up really, really big on a, um, in a microscope, it would look like that. It would be big, chunky, you know, filling up that little piece of the slide. This next jar has a bunch of um, pony beads in it, little child beads, lots of colors. Um, but that's kind of a representation of silt. You would see there's some air spaces in there, you know, with the two golf balls in the ball, there's lots of air, lots of air spaces in the sand. In the silt, um, there's less air spaces than in the clay, but there's still, there's still a lot of movement that can happen. This last one is only about, I don't know, a quarter, a third full of glitter, <laughs> but I, I didn't have enough glitter to fill the jar up. <laughs> Um, but that's kind of, if you imagine clay, clay is a little tiny disc, like a penny almost, and they just stack right on top of each other. And you don't have these big air spaces that are in there. Um, so if you can think about that, when you're thinking about your soil, you can understand a little bit about clay and why it's so sticky. <laughs> um, I just, I just like that as kind of a, a visual. And I was trying to explain it on here since the folks watching the video can't see. Um, so this is, and I've got a couple of pictures of, of, of these three things. So sand, again, large particles, it's mostly quartz. When you rub it in your fingers, you're gonna feel grit. It's like rubbing sandpaper, it's, it's sand, it feels gritty. Um, silt, uh, we mostly see silt in, rivers and waterways. We don't, you can, you can feel it. It feels like you're, like you're rubbing flour. Like it's kind of smooth, almost has a waxy tendency to it. Um, but you can see in this river that's discharging here on the screen, there's a lot of soil particles floating around in there. Clay also floats around in water pretty well when it's dissolved. Um, but mostly whenever you see silt, you're going to see it in and wash. Clay, like I said, we are all familiar with clay here in Georgia. Teeny tiny little bitty particles. Um, it's got a lot of secondary minerals in it. Feels sticky. Um, it's moldable. It's malleable. When you cut your uh, shovel down into the soil, it stays in the shape of the, the shovel. <laughs> if you cut a shovel in and move it and it goes and it falls apart, then Maybe it's amended to the point where it's not purely just a ball of clay. Um, before I go on, clay gets a bad rap. So clay is actually one of the, of the three soil types. It's the best at holding nutrients. It's the most nutrient rich type that you're gonna find. Um, the problem with clay is that it dries out and it's really hard to re-moisturize. So um, what I tell everyone that complain, excuse me, complains about their clay is just keep it moist. Don't let it dry out. If it dries out, <clears throat> you're gonna have to cover it with some mulch, um, <clears throat> put sprinklers on it, keep it when it gets cracks in it, <laughs> that's when it's bad. Um, if you can keep it moist, you can grow just about anything in clay. Um, and I say that obviously you can't grow beach plants that grow in sand in clay. Like you can grow most of, your, most of the things that you want to grow. Um, it does need some organic matter, which I'll get to that in a little bit, but clay is great because it holds nutrients. Sand doesn't hold on to a thing. So if you have really sandy soil, you're going to be fertilizing it a whole lot more. You're going to be moisture, adding moisture to it a whole lot more. Um, so there's, there's good and bad to each, pros and cons to each, each soil type. This is a soil texture triangle. Um, to decipher this, this is all clay. This is 100% clay. This is the stuff they're digging out of the mines out around Augusta. You know, it's there is nothing else in there but clay. We don't have that here. <laughs> this is 100% sand. We're at the beach, okay? 100% uh, silt. I, I've never seen 100% silt, but I'm sure it exists somewhere, maybe along riverbeds and things like that where it's been deposited. We exist somewhere in here. 
were maybe sandy clay or silt clay. Usually the silt you're gonna find, like I said, around riverbeds and things like that. That's mostly where you find that silty. If you're kind of a good mixture of them all, that's what they call loam. It's clay, sand, and silt. But you can see it's not this direct center. This is the center of the triangle here. That's still considered clay loam because clay, there's so many particles in the same volume of, of each of the three types that it shifts down here to where this is kind of the center at the bottom of this triangle of the sand, sand clay silt. So this doesn't mean though that you should go buy a truckload of sand and mix it into your, your clay at home. Because what that's gonna do is make something very similar to concrete. <laughs> <laughs> that you don't want. <laughs> um, the, best, the best thing to do is just learn, learn to love the soil that you have. Amend it with um, some organic matter, which again, like I said, we'll get to it. Um, but most, most of us and what we have is, is this clay loam here. It just depends on how, how close to riverbeds or um, sandy areas that you are, whether it's sandy clay or silt clay. Um, this is a fun little activity for determining soil texture. I did this um, in a lunch and learn one time and realized that was kind of a bad idea to have people <laughs> squishing up food and then we're all like, ew, <laughs> or not squishing up food, squishing up their soil. Um, but it's definitely, it's something you can do at home. And of course, everyone who's gardened and forgotten their gloves, you know that our clay sticks everywhere. So um, best, best done at home. <laughs> But um, you can get a about a golf ball sized amount in your hand. It needs to be moist, obviously not dripping. Um, kind of knead it like you do Play-Doh, get it kind of worked through. And then they, say, they call it making a ribbon and you're just pressing it through like this. You're feeling it, like I said before, the sand is gonna feel gritty, the silt is gonna feel waxy, um, the clay is gonna feel silky and smooth. And how much clay depends on how long of a ribbon you make. Um, I'm a fan of flow charts, um, so this can be found uh, on the internet. Um, but it's, you know, add water, does the soil remain in a ball, make the ribbon, does it form a ribbon? And if the answer is no, you've got loamy sand. You basically don't have much clay in there. If it makes a weak ribbon, less than two and a half centimeters long before breaking, then you go down and it's going to be either sandy loam, silt loam, or loam based on how it actually feels in your hand. If it makes a two and a half to five centimeter ribbon before breaking, you've got sandy clay loam, silty clay loam, or clay loam. If it makes a long ribbon, I, I can't imagine something, you know, seven centimeters long, it holding together that long, then it's either sandy clay, silty clay, or clay. So it kind of steps you through how to figure out what kind of soil you have. Um, another thing you can do, and I took the pictures out of here just for time, you can take a little jar like this, fill it about to there with soil, fill it up, not clear to the top, leave some room so that you can shake it with water and um, put a lid on it, shake 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 it, set it down and don't touch it. And you'll have to leave it there for a couple of days. Um, this, the silt and the clay, the silt will set, the sand settles out first. You'll just immediately, you'll see a little layer at the bottom. The silt will settle out next. Um, the clay can take, it can take days to settle out, um, but you'll have little layers and then you can just take a ruler and measure it and figure out the percentage that you have and use that little soil triangle and say, oh, I have silty clay loam or, what, or whatnot. Um, so that's a, that's another, another little way, but you can, like I said, most of us around here, we're going to have sandy clay loam, silty clay loam, clay loam, or that sandy or silty clay. It just depends on how big of a ribbon it makes and how it feels. All right, so all that soil texture. So that's, it's literally, it's what it feels like. It's how close are the particles together in that, in that piece of clay. All right, what do we do with that, right? <laughs> soil texture is difficult to change. I mean, our gardens are big. You know, or if you have if you have a small garden, then that's easy. But you know, it's 
it's kind of like aquariums. You get one fish aquarium and then you have to have another one and another one. It's like multiple aquarium disease. I think we have multiple garden disease too, where we grow one and we're like, oh, I love it. And I'm going to do it over here. And I'm going to do it over here. And then soon your garden is so big that you, um, you can't go in and change your soil um, short of getting machinery in there and digging it out. And then what you put back in there is not, what you buy at the store is not really soil. So, um, so soil texture, got a couple more pieces, air, water, and organic matter. So believe it or not, roots actually need oxygen and they give off carbon dioxide. Um, it's not just the leaves that need, that need air. So again, imagining that clay soil that's really, really full of water, what, what is being displaced there? It's all the air in the soil. So you have roots that then are basically suffocating for lack of a better word. They don't have access to the air that they need. And that's when you have plants that are all turning yellow because there's too much water oh. in the soil. They need air, which is why a lot of directions will say, allow the soil to dry out before you water again, because the roots need water. Um, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was a nutrient. I'm sorry. Well, you're fine. We, we had a big light bulb go off in the audience. So, um, so proper watering allows for air and water to be in the pores. Um, and it is good to water until the water comes out of the bottom of a pot. Obviously you can't do this in a garden because that's pushing out some of that stagnant air. Cause obviously a, the soil is not breathing. It's not exchanging fresh air for stagnant air. So once it uses up all the oxygen that's in the soil, it, it needs some fresh oxygen in there. So by let it dry out, water it, it pushes out some of that air. You'll see the, in some pots, it'll, it'll gurgle. Boop, 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 boop. Um, so that's exchanging that air and keep, keeping the soil fresh. So your soil will be healthier if you are having good moisture, but also air kind of in the soil. Because remember that ideal soil is the same amount of air as it is water in that soil, um, which makes you think, okay, a light fluffy, especially in a pot, a light fluffy soil is, is what you want. Uh, but how do you get that in the clay, right? <laughs> That's where the organic soil components come in. So um, this is the, um, the organic term meaning living or once was living, composed of carbon. Um, you've got roots, mycorrhizal fungi and bacteria that's actually alive in the soil. Um, you have dead things in the soil. You have plant remains, dead roots, dead microbes. You have dead organisms in the soil. And then once it's dead, decomposed, it forms humus, which is just a, a nice um, black gold is what, what, what we call it. <laughs> but um, it's kind of the end product of, of composting. So you go through composting. Um, that organic matter is home to so many soil organisms, not just earthworms, insects, there's bacteria, fungi, all kinds of critters rely on all three pieces of these organic soil components. So what does organic matter do in soil? It enhances soil moisture. So you remember all my, you know, we gotta have moisture. It's 24, 25% of the soil. Clay, don't let it dry out. So it enhances the soil moisture, improves aeration because it's putting little fluffy pockets into your soil. And so you're gonna have some places for air to go in clay and it increases nutrition because as it breaks down, it's releasing those macronutrients into the soil. But too much can cause nutrient toxicity. So you can actually over amend your soil with too much organic matter. Then you don't have enough soil of that, that mineral piece, which was about 45% of the, the soil makeup. So typically what we say is 5% by weight, 10% 10, 10 by volume. Of course, it's really hard to measure that kind of volume percentage in your garden. Now in a pot, sure, that's easy to figure out, but, um, if you think about how far down plant roots grow, and it, it's different based on different plants, but say in a typical vegetable or flower garden, roots probably go down about 12 inches. So if you can visualize that, usually one to two inches of, 
um, organic matter is, whoops, is perfectly fine. Um, but again, too much, and we'll get into some nutrient toxicities here in a minute, but it can cause problems. Um, so how much organic matter is in your soil? That's like the million dollar question, right? Like, okay, if it's so good, how do I know what's in there? Kind of like nitrogen, it, it depends. Depends on how much rainfall we've had, how humid it is outside, what the temperature is. Um, organic matter decomposes at rates based on all those things. Um, frequent tilling actually reduces the organic matter because it increases air in the soil and air is needed for decomposition. So if you increase air, you're increasing the rate at which organic matter decomposes, which is going to reduce the amount of organic matter, if that makes sense. So every time you till, you almost, you, you're probably gonna need to add a little organic matter to it because it's going to start getting used up. In the summer, it gets used up quickly. In the winter, it, it doesn't decompose much at all. Um, poorly drained soils have less organic matter because of that reduction of oxygen. So we can soil test at extension. I think I, I must've put the amount in, a, in the wrong place, but it's uh, $12. What they do is you give them um, soil, just like in these, in these little brown soil bags, and they will dry it and weigh it completely dry, like they kiln dry it. Then they take it and put it into an incinerator and burn the soil. Everything that burns away was organic. And what you're left is the minerals, which don't burn. So they weigh that and then they can tell you by weight how much organic matter is in your soil. So if you're worried that maybe you have too much, um, I, I see a lot of people that get build a raised bed and they buy the, the soil from, you know, a big box store or a, um, a garden center or something like that. And they can't grow anything in it. Like they plant broccoli and the broccoli just kind of stays really skinny and it, it, it never flourishes and puts on all the leaves and makes a flower head. Um, a lot of times it's because there's not a lot of soil in that. It's mostly organic matter and you can't grow something in total organic matter. Um, not grow well. So, um, so if you're having trouble in a certain area, or if it, especially if it's a bed that you've made yourself, um, by bringing in some soil, you may have a little bit of an organic matter um, issue there. All right, so we talked about soil texture. We talked about organic matter. It increases water retention, gas exchange, nutrient availability. So again, would we, should we put truckloads of organic matter on the garden? I'm a cheap and lazy gardener, so I don't. <laughs> but um, there's another piece and it's chemical properties of the soil. So here we are, we're gonna get into chemistry class now. So in the soil, there's um, a marker that, it describes how well it, picks up and lets go of nutrients. So it's called the cation exchange capacity. All these nutrients you can see in here, calcium, magnesium, potassium, aluminum, hydrogen, salt, or sodium, um, those all have positive charges on them. I don't know if you can see it, it's, it's pretty tiny. It just looks like little asterisks. <laughs> um, all of the nutrient exchange in the soil between the plant and whatever soil particle is done through ions. It's a positive charge going to a negative charge. It's, you know, the same as magnets. The positive side is attracted to the negative side. Um, water is required. So you can see in this picture that um, there's some space in here. Remember from that picture before, the root, the root hairs do go in between these little particles here. And they're just showing this so that you can see the see the space, but there is still in, in those spaces, there's water. Water is necessary to move those positive ions to the negative receptors there on the root hairs. So a soil with a high CEC cation exchange capacity holds onto more nutrients and they can buffer changes in the levels of nutrients. So if you have too much of one particular nutrient, 
it's okay. It can kind of hang on to it. And the, it's not going to, the plant is not going to be able to, to take that readily. So uh, if you have high clay, silt, and organic matter, you're going to have a higher cation exchange capacity. You don't have to do much to that soil because it's, you nutrients are being held in the soil as long as, again, appropriate water. If that clay dries out, that nutrients are there in the clay, but they can't get to the plant. They can't get to the roots. If you have sandy soil, sand is the worst for cation exchange capacity. It just, there's all these little nutrients floating around in the water. And as soon as it dries up or it, it washes away with all that water, it, it can't get to the plant. So it's almost like, um, I'm trying to think of an analogy with like vitamins where like, you know, if you take a vitamin and, you know, you go to the bathroom, it just washes right away, right? But some of the vitamins we can actually store in our body and things like that. It's similar to that. These, it was sandy. It's like everything you add to it is just going to wash away. Um, if you know you have sandy soil, you can take a fertilizer recommendation and break it into quarters and just apply it in intervals through your growing season. Because if you apply it all at once, it's just gonna wash wherever all, you know, all your um, runoff goes to the next time it rains. So to improve the soil, um, don't walk on your garden beds or work wet soil, because when you work wet soil, you're packing it back together and all that air gets pushed out of the soil. Same as when you walk on your garden beds. If there's a way that you can put stepping stones in or um, something like that, you're not going to, you're gonna have it compacted in very specific places that you're not gonna be planting in. Um, you wanna reduce your drainage problems. You don't want standing water in places because again, the plants, the roots need that, need the oxygen. Um, there are some plants that grow in water, but of course they're adapted to the low oxygen environments or they can take oxygen out of the water itself. You obviously want to decrease erosion. If you have erosion problems, it's washing away your soil and that's that's what you need. You want to keep you want to keep your soil. Um, you can plant cover crops which will help with a lot of these things. Some of the cover crops actually will put nutrients back into the soil. You just have to make sure that you're when you cut the cover crop you have to leave it in place or till it down into the soil so that it leaves it, because if you cut it and remove it, then you've just moved all the nutrients wherever you left all your, your cup. You can uh, incorporate organic matter. For example, when starting a garden, do you have a question? So sorry. No, you're okay. What would be a cover crop? Oh, okay, a cover crop, um, there's clover that can be planted. Um, a lot of the um, agriculture, um, like farmers, will plant, say, corn and then soybeans, and then they'll plant um, a, a bean or something that they are going to leave in place and till into the ground or a clover. They can take nitrogen from the air and put it into the plant. So a lot of plants, most plants can't pull nitrogen from the air. They um, require it to come out of the soil. But um, a lot of the cover crops can pull nitrogen out of the air, so it's kind of like free nitrogen. So, in the, but if you mow it and like if you were making hay and you're rolling it up, then you're, you're taking the nutrients out of the ground again, just like you do when you grow a garden. You're, you're removing nutrients out of the soil when you harvest your plants, okay? So a cover crop is a, a way of growing a plant that then feeds the, feeds the soil underneath. Um, you can incorporate organic matter, that one to three inch organic mulch on the surface. Um, this is a this is next to my house. My house was built in 2006, and um, they scraped away all the topsoil, of course. So all I have is this like really, it it's almost completely clay. I mean, it's it's probably a clay clay loam. I don't think there's a, a bit of sand in it. Maybe a little bit of silt, but um, this is just a flower bed next to my my house, and we put woody mulch on it and just over time this is this black stuff is all humus that's built up over time um, you can see in places it looks like it's starting to get work down in here that's what the earthworms and everything does um, i don't till over here because there's all kinds of i don't I don't till anymore let me just be really honest but 
Um, it's more of a laziness issue than it is. <laughs> um, the, the earthworms and all work it down in there, but there's like wires under there and plants and tilling, you know, if you can't till the whole bed, like it's, it's really just not, it's not worth trying to get in there. You're going to damage the plants too much, but I dig in there every now and then. And I thank the earthworms for their, their hard work. Cause it's not me doing hard work. <laughs> um, but that, that humus as that mulch breaks down, it takes, when you use a, a woody mulch, that's not bark. So this is like pieces of wood. You can see there's leaves down in here. There's even some pine straw. It's just a mess of all kinds of things, but it breaks down and feeds the soil as you, as it breaks down um, and improves that soil composition. So in this area, if I didn't have the mulch and this nice layer of humus on it, it would be just a brick whenever I dug into it. So um, just a little example of adding that, um, that mulch and just letting nature kind of start working the soil. Um, when a garden's first created, you can till in that compost, but you don't really till in sub subsequent years. Uh, you can top dress. It'll be brought down by soil organisms and things like that. And top dressing is where you would just, you would just put a row of organic matter just in between the plants here. And you can do that during the season too. If you're um, against adding um, man-made fertilizers and things like that, um, you can top dress. There's just less, you don't know exactly what you're adding whenever you're using um, some of the organic, uh, the not organic as in made of carbon, but the organic um, as in not man-made um, types of, uh, what am I trying to say, amendments. Um, an established garden, you top dress with one to three inches of compost, um, and you can base that on that organic matter test. You may not need organic matter, or you might, you know, test it and you, you show you need it. So there, there I have that $12. All right, so we have to do a little bit more chemistry. So we're going to go into soil pH. So most people are familiar with the pH scale. Are you, do you guys need me to explain it? I will. I just don't want to explain something if you're like, no, we're good. I understand pH. Acids, bases, you guys, okay. Most of us that cook have some kind of understanding of acids and bases, or you remember when you added baking soda to vinegar and it blew up as a kid. <laughs> so the pH scale has um, a lot to do with that nutrient exchange because the pH scale is measuring the concentration of hydrogen ions compared to just plain water that has nothing in it. So if you remember those ions, that's those nutrients that were getting into the roots was because of that ion exchange. So depending on your pH, different nutrients are available or not available to plants. So the ideal pH for most plants is in this little blue bar or not blue, green bar here, 5.4 to 6.0, so that's slightly acidic. Seven is neutral, one is battery acid. So, you know, slightly acidic. Um, but each plant species has their own ideal pH that they operate best under. So blueberries, for example, they're better in this really four and a half to five range. And it may be that to grow, they just don't need that much magnesium. You know, I don't, I don't know what it is. But see, they have more access to some of these other micro, or secondary macronutrients. They may need more phosphorus. You know, different, different plants have different needs, just like different people have different needs. Um, you can't permanently change your soil pH. If you have a 7.5 and that's just what you have, to keep it here is a constant, constant amendment to the soil. So any change you make is short term. It's just going to constantly be, the soil is trying to get back to that equilibrium of where it likes to be. So if it, it's 7.5, it's always going to be going back to 7.5. Um, and that's soil testing. Mm -hmm. Soil test. I, I have a I have a couple slides on soil testing that'll tell you it'll tell you your soil pH. 
Um, you can raise the pH, so make it more alkaline with lime, or you can lower the pH with sulfur. So this is a little plant example. Um, this is a maple leaf. It's exhibiting what's called iron chlorosis. So you can see the veins are dark green and in between the veins is yellow. Um, it's a really common plant symptom that once you see it and you're like, I know what that is. Um, just some background, the tree is located in a low area at the edge of a Bermuda lawn where regular lime applications are made every year. Every year, Bermuda loves alkaline soil. It doesn't like the acidic soil, which typically our clay is a little on the acidic side. It's in that ideal plant growing zone. Um, soil test shows the soil around the tree is 7.8. So if you have a plant problem that you can't figure out, you can soil test in specific right around a tree to see if you can figure out what's going on in this sp specific area. So the soil test around the tree is 7.8. Uh, iron is not reported on the soil test. Red clay is red because iron. There's plenty of iron in the soil. Um, iron chlorosis, so this look is called iron chlorosis because there's a lack of iron in the plant. So if we know we live in Georgia, red clay, plenty of iron, but my plant is showing a lack of iron, what's going on? So the lime has probably run off of the Bermuda grass and is settled around this maybe little low spot around this tree. And the pH has gone up from whatever its natural area is. But because the lime is constantly being added to the, to the, the grass every year by the lawn treatment company, the soil pH is now, it just is constantly being raised around the tree. Because of the raised pH, the iron is less available. So I'm going to go back to this one. Can you see there's iron right here? If we get up here at 7.8, it's a lot less iron available to that plant than here. So you can show iron chlorosis, but it's not an iron problem. It's a pH problem because the higher pH is hanging on to that iron. The iron is there. It's just not letting go of it to give it to the plant. All right, so that's why pH is important. This is a really busy, busy, busy chart, but I've highlighted nitrogen, phosphate, and potash, potassium, K here. This is called Mulder's chart. It's nutrient interaction. So if there's a red line, it means that an increase in one causes a decrease in the other. So it's opposite interaction. If there's a green line, an increase in one is an increase in the availability of the other. Okay, so they move together. There's a lot of red lines on this chart. That's just my main thing I wanna highlight here. <laughs> if you have too much phosphate in your soil, look at all the nutrients that are affected by too much phosphate in the soil. All right, you can have an iron deficiency if you have too much phosphate. It can show up in your plant as that iron chlorosis if your phosphate is just off the charts, which can all be told to you in a, in a soil test. It'll tell you phosphate and potassium. Um, it's just, it's not something to memorize. It's not something to, you know, I don't know this by heart, but I refer to it when I have a problem that I just can't put my finger on it. My pH looks right. This is okay, but I have my potassium, my, my phosphate's kind of high. Oh, maybe that's what's going on. And to remove phosphate from the soil, you literally just have to grow the heck out of the soil. You have to just grow, 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 and use it up and not add any phosphate to the soil as you grow. So, um, I, I bring this up because I have um, a raised bed that we made from native soils, um, but I inherited it from the people who had grown before. And if I had to guess, if I could have been a fly on the wall when he was throwing fertilizer, he was putting out 10, 10, 10, just every year. That's what he had always done. It's what his dad had always done, throwing out the 10, 10, 10. When I did my first soil test there, my phosphate was 
off the charts. Like it was ridiculously high. Nitrogen was fine. Potassium was high. Um, and I had to, I had to put only N and K into my garden with zero phosphate as, as my fertilizer, uh, so that it would use the phosphate up in the soil as it grew. It's not fun to have to try to shop for specific, um, specific fertilizers like that. But I do have a couple of slides on that in a little bit. So the last piece is growing conditions. This is like I talked about first. If you see cracks in your soil, you, ha you have a moisture problem. You need some um, mulch over it. You need organic matter in there. Kind of like people, we don't do well with extremes. I don't like being really, really cold. I don't like being really, really hot. I like just a nice, comfortable, stable temperature. Um, they do the same with light. They don't like, you know, you, you grow a plant um, that you've started from seed inside and you go throw it out in the sunshine, it's going to burn up just like that. You need to move it to the shade and then move it into the sun so that it gradually, it does, they don't take shocks, shocking changes in their temperature, their, the light water. You can't not water a plant for six months and water it and expect it to be fine. It's just, they don't do well with extremes. <laughs> and then compacted soil, you know, you can't expect to drive over the, under the canopy of a tree and the tree not experience some problems because of that. Not only breaking of roots and things like that, but that soil's compacted, the air is pushed out of it, and the tree doesn't have access to the same nutrients as it did. So, You've got to consider all those conditions. So not only soil testing, what's your soil texture? Do I have enough moisture? Do I have enough air in the soil? Is there enough organic matter? But am I giving the plant the best, best chance at survival? Does it have um, the temperature it expects? You know, I have some lemon trees on my back porch that I've got to get into my little greenhouse I keep over the winter because they're not going to do well with our winter temperatures here. So you know, keeping it stable for what the plant prefers is ideal. All right, so we've talked about all this. So it's like drinking through a fire hose. It's a whole lot of information. What do you do with it? So we soil test. That's the first thing. If any of you were ever email me and say, hey, I've got this plant problem, I say, well, what's your last soil test say? It's just, it's kind of like going to the doctor and getting your blood drawn you know, where they do that, that basic thing they do every year and checking everything. It's, it's just how you get a quick health check on your soil. Um, you collect the sample, fill out the bag, fill the bag. Um, the office is over by the landfill, uh, kind of, you can't get to it through the big courthouse. It's like the road next to it. It's County Farm Road, but it's right over there. You can follow the signs over, um, it's in the same place as the 4-H office. You can do cash or credit card and it's $8. Um, you'll get an email result in seven to 10 days. Um, and I have a picture of what that result looks like. So you can collect samples in many ways. Like I said, with that one plant issue, you can sample right around that tree or that shrub or in that flower bed where you're having a problem. Um, otherwise you could say, I wanna test my vegetable garden um, or I wanna test in my wooded area. Maybe you're gonna work on kind of Re rehabilitating an area back with native plants and things like that. But that wooded area is going to have much different soil than your vegetable garden because you're not going to be dropping a bunch of organic matter and tending that soil quite the same as you would in your vegetable garden. Same with your grass, your turf. It's treated totally different than we treat a vegetable, so vegetable garden. So if you have low-lying areas and areas that are just treated differently, then test them separately. Um, I didn't talk about this. You actually, so if this is the vegetable garden, take many samples of the area, just walk around taking um, a little spade like this and you just take a little bit and toss it into a bucket, um, mix it all up. Um, and then you put it into that little sample bag. Um, yeah. No, 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 no. You mix it all up. So that way it's, it's a sample of the area, not just of what you dug in one, one spot. And lawns, you can dig to about four inches. That's about how, how deep grass roots go. So if you're testing because you have a, 
you know, your Bermuda is not growing as, as well as you think it should. Um, you don't have to go down very deep. Um, but in a garden, you want to go down about six inches. So that's in that grow zone where almost every plant has roots. And there is a little hand probe. That's what this thing is where you can kind of step on it, stick it down in the soil and you get a little plug out and the, the office, the extension office has one that folks can borrow if you have a big area. Otherwise I just, I just do the spade in a bucket. So this is a, I'm gonna zoom in on this, but this is what the soil um, test report looks like. Um, this was one I did for um, West Jackson Elementary. Uh, they had some raised beds. So you're gonna get pH right here. Uh, you're gonna get your major nutrients, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and zinc. And then down here, you get recommendations on fertilizer and lime. So here I zoomed in on that piece because I know it was teeny tiny up there. So what I wanna draw to you here is pH. So it says 6.2 and they make it really easy. They're like, you don't need lime or you do need lime. So you do in this right here, you can see teeny tiny, I say it's a home vegetable garden. Um, depending on the crop, that can change for a sample. Um, you can request on a sample for them to run different crops for you. So if you ran home vegetable and then you're like, you know, I changed my mind. Let's say it's a month or two later. I'm going to plant blueberries here. You can tell them you want to want it run on blueberries in particular, and it'll, it'll update all this. Um, you can see here potassium. It needs nutrients. So look at phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, zinc, There's all kind of nutrients in their soil there. Just not quite enough potassium. And then you may say, well, hey, Brandy, where's, where's nitrogen? I see phosphorus and potassium, but all the fertilizer bags say NPK. Where is that, where's that nitrogen? Well, I wasn't sure if I left my slide in there on that. The nitrogen cycle could be a whole nother lecture on <laughs> where nitrogen comes from, how it is used up on the earth, where it goes up into the clouds and when, have you ever noticed your, your garden the next day after a thunderstorm, like a good lightning storm is like really green? It's because when lightning goes through the air, it actually causes, so N2 is two atoms of nitrogen is what floats around in atmospheric air. It splits that, it pops into a bubble of water and rains down. And you are literally getting fertilizer whenever it lightnings. We can't measure that. <laughs> We can't measure the cow that's eating the grass. So he's eating nitrogen and processes it and poops it out. Like there are so many cycles in with the nitrogen cycle that what it would be would be a, a, a sample of at eight o'clock in the morning when you took your sample, that's how much nitrogen was in the soil. It's not entirely meaningful. So it's not on the soil test. You can get a nitrogen test done. They're expensive and they don't really give you the information that you need. If you were a grower and you were growing this as your business, it might be valuable to you, especially in a greenhouse where you have pots and it's controlled and you know for the most part what's coming and going because you're not having, you know, rainstorms, lightning that's, for, you know, then it may, it may be useful for you. But for the average home gardener, it really isn't. So the soil test recommendation, it's gonna say there's no limestone recommended. Your target pH is 6.0 to 6.5, which, whoops, I keep hitting the wrong button. It was 6.2, so we're good there. It says broadcast 20 pounds of 15.05. So remember those fertilizers is NPK. So that means no phosphorus, because remember our phosphorus was really high here and you needed potassium. So, per thousand square feet or seven pounds of 1505 per hundred linear feet of row. So depending on how you have your garden, I normally measure mine in square feet because I don't grow in rows. I don't, my garden's not that big, not that big. Um, there's some calculators that you can use. There's a little link here that comes on it that tells you how to recalculate that because these are percentages. So this, and 
you know, and whatever scoop of fertilizer, it's 15% nitrogen, 0% potassium, or excuse me, phosphate, 15% um, potassium. So that's for a thousand. So if you need to half that, it would be, if you had a 500 square feet garden, then it's 10 pounds. But if it's, you know, if you have a 75 square foot garden, it's just a little bit of complicated, you know, math and getting those proportions right. So you can pop it into the calculator and it's a lot easier. And then because our crop was home garden, it says the recommendation given above is for medium feeders, including beans, beets, cantaloupes, cucumbers, eggplant, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. For heavy feeders, such as broccoli, cabbage, greens, lettuce, Irish potatoes, and sweet corn, increase the recommendation by 50%. So you would do 30 pounds if you have a thousand square feet of heavy readers, heavy feeders. For light feeders like southern peas, reduce the recommendation by half. So whatever that average recommendation is, you either increase by 50% or reduce by half. Um, it also says apply a tablespoon of borax per 100 feet of row of broccoli and root crops like turnips and beets. You can mix it into some of the soil and then kind of sprinkle it because, you know, a tablespoon of borax is not you would be kind of sprinkling like this. So it's easier to kind of mix it in with something else and then broadcast it out that way. It says you can mix it into a quart of water and kind of spray it onto the soil too. And then here, that last paragraph, it says for better fertilizer availability on sandy soils, apply half just before planting and the remainder when the crop is half grown. If you have unusually heavy rainfall of sandy soils, you may, it says you may have to add some more nitrogen because all that's gonna wash due to the heavy rains. So a lot of good information in the soil tests. Um, this is just a little bag of fertilizer, just to remind you those, those numbers stand for N, P, and K. They're always in that order. If you see those, those, um, those numbers, and those are just the elements from the periodic table of elements. So remember I told you I had to find, and in this example, it was a zero phosphate fertilizer. So sometimes you have to look at fertilizers that may not say this is tomato fertilizer. You know, this is a tree and shrub fertilizer. It's got 41010. Now, I don't, unless you're supplementing nitrogen with something else, I would follow the nitrogen recommendation that comes back in that soil test. Um, but it says a balanced formula to correct fertilizer deficiencies in trees and shrubs. Well, that's not true. If you have too much potassium or, or phosphorus, this is not going to correct your, your, your fertilizer deficiency. It's going to make your fertilizer problem worse. You know, so look at, look at what is in the guaranteed analysis. Don't follow the instructions. But all these other words that are like guaranteed to make your tomatoes grow, it's like, well, you don't know what I have in my soil. Um, this, there is a chart that you can find. And if you prefer to grow um, organically, just write down UGA extension, it's circular 853. This shows the average NPK analysis of organic um, ways of fertilizing. So here it's got alfalfa meal is 312, blood meal is 12, one and a half point six. Um, there's really not anything that's close to like a average 10, 10, 10. The guano, bat, let's see, this is Peruvian bat guano is 12 and a half, 11.2 and 2.4. So like you would still need some potassium in that one. Um, and then it tells you the relative availability. So in organic fertilizers, it relies on bacteria and fungi in the soil to release that into the soil. So when you put blood meal out, it's not automatically putting 12% nitrogen in the soil. It's, it's faster than if you put coffee grounds into the soil. But, um, oops, but Organic relies on a lot more of the natural um, processes that are going on in the soil. So in that sense, it's more unpredictable as to when your plant can actually use those nutrients. Um, 
bagged fertilizer, like when you put it out and you wet it, it's there. Like it, it dissolves. It's immediately in a form that the plants can use. Um, and you know how much you put there. So you know that you're not causing toxicities and things like that. So there's, there's with, ev with every method of growing, there are pros and cons to them. Um, but that's a, that's a really good reference for people that um, prefer to grow organically. So that's all that I have for my presentation, which like I said, is a little like a drinking through a fire hose. It's a lot of information. Do you guys have any questions? I'm glad she <laughs> said they learned a lot. Yeah. Okay. Um, you can you can write my email address down if you want. It's JC, like Jackson County. Is it on the website? Good. MG for Master Gardener. EV for Extension Volunteer. So JCMGEV at UGA.edu. And you're welcome to email me questions if you get home and you're like, you said something about this. Can you send that to me? I will surely, I will send you whatever. That's, that's what I do. I'm a volunteer. I'm here for homeowners. Um, I volunteer for the extension agent. Greg Pittman is our extension agent here in Jackson County, but um, he is so busy with farms and growers that are they're in harvest right now and they're, you know, facing other issues and problems and he, he just doesn't have time to answer a lot of homeowner questions. And so um, if you call the office, it's totally fine. You can do that. They'll probably filter you to me because um, it could be three or four weeks before he can get to get to where he can answer your question. Um, you can email me directly. That's perfectly fine. Um, pictures are good. I can't go out and visit everyone. I'm the only like I said, I'm the only active master gardener in the county. So while I love going and seeing other people's gardens and going, oh, did you know this? And did you see this? And it's a lot of fun. I can't do it. I can't do it all the time. Um, but pictures are great. I can identify insect problems. Sometimes even I can take, you can take a picture of an area and say, I'm having a water problem here and I'll see something that maybe you just didn't, didn't realize. Sometimes when you see your own garden for a while you you get numb to what, what's always been there and so having another set of eyes on something helps you got a bug that you don't know I know you were talking about your was it bok choy that you were having trouble with um, I can identify bugs but sometimes when you take a picture of a leaf with a bunch of holes in it we can identify it but finding the culprit is the is the best thing um, sometimes you have to go out at night with a flashlight <laughs> or get up early in the morning, which is not my, not my favorite way of finding them. All right. 